the greatest nation in the history of the world? There is a real crisis. And to paraphrase Winston Churchill, haven't we now exhausted every other possibility? Isn't it finally time to do the right thing? Amend the Constitution, save the country, balance the budget. I yield back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. I yield myself uh, five seconds. I, I hope that, that those words will help us in the super committee that the gentleman from Mississippi is working on night and day. And I yield now. I only had five seconds, sir. Texas, not Mississippi. Uh, I now uh, yield to the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Bobby Scott, the former subcommittee chair of the Crime Committee, and, Were you a budget committee? I was on the budget. I was and a member of the Budget Committee, is a former member of the Budget Committee, and I yield him five minutes, sir. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the supporters of this legislation have spoken at length about how nice it would be to balance the budget and how dangerous deficits are. The speeches, great speeches about the budget, but the one thing they have not talked about is how the provisions of this legislation will actually help balance the budget. Now, we had a hearing earlier, uh, uh, earlier this month where the former governor of Pennsylvania talked about the Pennsylvania balanced budget amendment and how their constitutional provision was such a good thing. But he had to acknowledge that other than the title, there is nothing in H.J. Res 2 that can be found in the Pennsylvania Constitution. We also found that the gentleman from Arizona had to acknowledge, after he talked about how good the balanced budget amendment works in Arizona, that Arizona was able to balance its budget only because federally borrowed stimulus money provided $6 billion to Arizona, $1,000 for every man, woman, and child in that, in that state. And that wasn't enough. Arizona had to sell their state capital and Supreme Court building. That's right. Sold their state capital and Supreme Court building and leased it back in order to achieve about a billion dollars worth of cash needed that year. So we should be looking at the provisions of the legislation, not just talking about how nice it is to balance the budget. One of the provisions is a three-fifths vote to um, increase the debt ceiling. Now, last August, the United States lost its AAA credit rating because it looked like we were not going to be able to achieve a simple majority. We should explain how it makes a lot of sense to make that spectacle an annual affair. Uh, I think most, uh, most people would think it would be fiscally irresponsible to enact that provision. Another provision is a three-fifths three vote to pass a budget that's not balanced in a given year. Um, that would cover every budget we considered this year, including the strongest deficit reduction plans, because those budgets are not balanced in the first year. Now, strong deficit reduction is politically difficult, because it's a we're talking about arithmetic. You have to raise taxes and or cut spending. Now, you can't get a simple majority. We can't even get a simple majority to do that. So why would anybody think that this, this legislation requiring a three-fifths vote would make it any easier? In fact, that same three-fifths vote will, will be sufficient to pass new tax cuts and additional spending, making the deficit worse. Last December, we passed an $800 billion tax cut. We got three-fifths for that. Uh, but instead of discussing just the title of the resolution, we should be noticing that if this legislation were, effect, were in effect in 1993, we never would have passed uh, that budget. And we've heard um, people on the other side of the aisle talk, taking credit for the hard work. I came in in 1993, and we passed a tough budget. There were tough votes. Fifty Democrats lost their seats as a direct result of those votes. The deficit was $290 billion at that point. In 1995, when the Republicans came in, uh, they passed their little budgets. And rather than sign those budgets, President Clinton let the, let the government get shut down rather than sign those budgets. They want to take credit. They can take credit for President Clinton vetoing their budgets and shutting down the government. 1997, the deficit had gone from 290 down to less than $25 billion, And there were no tough votes on that. 
the budget was on the way to balancing itself if we hadn't done anything. And so uh, we find out what would have happened if President Clinton hadn't capitulated in 1995 in 2001 when the Republicans came in with a Republican president, Republican Congress. We saw what happened. They passed two tax cuts, fought two wars without paying for them, prescription drug without paying for them. And rather than in 2001, when Chairman Greenspan had to answer questions like, what will happen when we pay off the national debt? Are we paying off the national debt too quickly? It looked like we were on target by 2008 to pay off the entire debt held by the public. Uh, those are the discussions. The first tax cut was the last time you heard any of that discussion. And as a result of the two tax cuts, two unpaid for wars and an unpaid for prescriptive drug benefit, we ended up in huge deficits. The fact is, the 1993 budget never would have passed if we had required a three-fifths vote. Now, uh, we should be focused on the actual effects of the resolution. There's another provision, and that's the um, provision uh, 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 involving war. All of the provisions of this budget can be set aside by a simple majority when a declared war is in effect, or can I have another a minute? One more minute. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, when when uh, the declared war is in effect, or when the United States is engaged in a mil military conflict which causes an imminent and serious military threat to national security, that provision ought to scare every two-bit dictator around the world, because if we're having trouble getting the three-fifths, all we've got to do is drop a bomb on them, and we can pass a budget with a simple majority. But we ought to be focused on the provisions of the bill. How will the three-fifths vote, which we can't even achieve a simple majority, help balance the budget. It should be obvious that rather than just talking about how nice it would be to balance the budget, how do these provisions actually make that easier? I think the fact of the matter is, if we adopt this resolution, it will be harder, if not impossible, to ever balance the budget, and that's why this resolution ought to be defeated. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds to... Uh complete the record. As I said in my remarks earlier, presidents of both parties and congresses of both parties have much to uh, explain in terms of the lack of balanced budgets over the last 50 years. Only six times in 50 years that they've been balanced. But here's the record. Of the 13 of those 50 years that Republicans controlled the Congress, they only balanced the budget four times. Of the 37 years that Democrats controlled the Congress during that time, they only balance the budget twice. It's now my pleasure to yield to the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, two minutes. The gentlelady from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would encourage my colleagues in this body to consider the balanced budget amendment and to support it. I do rise in support of this amendment because hardworking taxpayers know that out-of-control spending in Washington is killing job creation and economic growth. In less than three years, President Obama and his administration have added $4.3 trillion to our national debt, which is now over $15 trillion, astounding. That is $47,900 for every American. Is it really fair for our children and grandchildren to have to shoulder that kind of debt? for programs they don't want, having to pay for it with money they don't have? Is that really fair? The Obama economy is stifling the ability of small businesses and hardworking taxpayers to achieve their goals and dreams. It is time to rein in wasteful Washington spending. It is time to stop the madness. We need a permanent solution to the fiscal problems that are plaguing this economy, and the clear and common sense solution is to pass this balanced budget amendment. It's not a new idea. Every year in my state of Tennessee, our state, Cities and counties across our state all balance their budget. Forty-nine other states do. Passing a constitutional mandate would require Congress to balance the budget every year and legally obligate this body to spend only what it takes in. We can no longer kick the can down the road. We can't wait to replace Washington's blank check with the checks and balances necessary to provide true fiscal responsibility. Passing the balanced budget amendment is an effective component of accountability and spending control. Washington mandates too much, spends too much, 
takes too much and takes our freedom. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized. I'm pleased now to recognize the gentlelady, uh, Ms. Kathy Castor, for three minutes. And I thank the gentleman for yielding recognized time. for three minutes. I support a balanced budget, and I support a balanced budget amendment, but this version would place a very dangerous straitjacket on our country's ability to address a disaster. I'm very proud to represent the state of Florida, but after a year of devastating tornadoes, floods and fires all across this country. You do not have to hail from the state of Florida to understand the impact of a natural disaster and the importance of our ability to be a our ability to speed assistance to local communities. This amendment would erect roadblocks to our country's ability to address natural disasters and emergencies. Please recall how many of our GOP colleagues a few months ago sought to stall emergency aid. I will read uh, from a press report from back in August. Americans who saw their homes flooded, streets ripped apart, and businesses disrupted by last weekend's hurricane are about to face another storm, a new congressional battle. Unless additional disaster aid is appropriated, federal officials said communities trying to rebuild from natural disasters this year in the Midwest and South will have to wait while funds are diverted to help victims of Hurricane Irene. The recent string of disasters, including a tornado that tore through Joplin, Missouri, and a flood that inundated Minot, North Dakota, is running into the same political buzzsaw that nearly forced the government into default during the bitter flight fight over the debt ceiling this summer. Delays in emergency aid are unconscionable, and it is terrible for FEMA to have to choose between which American cities and towns can be helped and which ones can't. And the problem with this version of the balanced budget amendment is that it could cause impacted communities to live that nightmare again. It didn't happen after Hurricane Katrina or 9-11 or other disasters, but after the antics of this Republican Congress this past fall, I am very concerned that this version of the balanced budget amendment would allow another irresponsible Congress to block emergency assistance to local communities. We should not set our country up to be at the mercy of Tea Party hardliners, not at the times when our neighbors and communities need us most. I relayed my concerns to the House sponsor after he was kind enough to call me directly, and I appreciate that opportunity. Unfortunately, the Republicans did not allow any amendments or revisions, so I intend to file my own version of a balanced budget amendment, a version that seeks to avoid an irresponsible Congress from withholding disaster assistance. Because this version of the balanced budget amendment is flawed, I urge its defeat, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time it's my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier, who is a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of the balanced budget amendment. Forty-nine of the 50 states are required to balance their budgets. And while I'm certain that state legislatures will agree that it's always a difficult process, somehow they annually meet their obligations while achieving balance. The federal government should be able to do it too. But states aren't the only place Congress can look to for examples. Every family and every business in America has to balance expenses and income. They have every right to expect the federal government to do the same. But unfortunately, Congress has let them down time and again. But Mr. Speaker, the time has come to fix the problem. Constitutional amendments to require a balanced budget have been introduced in Congress for the past 75 years. Most recently in 1995, the House passed a balanced budget virtually identical to the one we're debating today, and it passed this House with bipartisan support. 72 Democrats and 228 Republicans. And because that amendment failed by one vote in the Senate, our national debt has now surpassed $15 trillion. The situation has only gotten worse, and the stakes today are much higher than 1995. This vote is an opportunity to prove to the American people that this Congress can work together 
and that we are finally committed to balancing our budget and putting our country back on fiscally solid ground. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, we reserve. The gentleman from Michigan reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Speaker, at this time it's my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bashan, who is a member of the Education and Workforce Committee. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. This is an opportunity for the federal government to keep our checkbook balanced, just as every American is expected to do. The House passed a very similar amendment in 1995 when our debt was $4.86 trillion. Seventy Democrats voted for the amendment, including 11 of my current colleagues. I urge my friends on the other side of the aisle to vote for this amendment now that our debt has tripled to over $15 trillion. The President recently said in regards to balancing the budget, and I quote, we don't need a constitutional amendment to do that. We don't need a constitutional amendment to do our jobs. The Constitution already tells us to do our jobs and make sure the government is living within its means and making responsible choices. Mr. President, I respectfully disagree. Washington, D.C. has not been able to make these choices and is not living within its means. I was elected by the people of Indiana's 8th Congressional District to help us make that happen. I'd also like to say that some of Mr. Hoyer's comments help us today to outline exactly why Washington, D.C. needs a balanced budget amendment. I thank him for that, for pointing those things, reasons out. This is not a partisan issue, Mr. Speaker. It's an American issue. I support this amendment, and I urge my colleagues today to vote yes on a balanced budget amendment. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Members are reminded to not traffic the well while all the members are speaking. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we reserve. Gentleman from Michigan reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time it's my pleasure to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Conaway, who is chairman of the Agriculture Committee, General Farm Commodities Subcommittee. Nice for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I should ask consent to revise and extend my remarks and add extraneous material. Mr. Speaker, imagine, uh, it's already been said tonight that 15 years ago we came within a, a, a chicken's whisker of passing a balanced budget amendment and sending it to the states. Imagine how different today's conversations would be uh, had the folks in charge then done that. We'd still be fussing and fighting uh, about what ought to be done, but the argument would be how do, we use to, uh, how do we solve today's problems using today's resources? Instead, we've stacked up another $9 trillion of future generations of Americans' uh, resources in our quest to solve these problems. Well, think about what 2026 will look at. Like. Fifteen years from now, the folks in charge then will be able to take out the projections that we have in place today and compare those to what is actually going on then if we pass this balanced budget amendment and say, wow, look how much better off this country is. They'll still be fussing and fighting, but it'll be using their resources to fix their problems uh, instead of the model that we've put in place collectively on both sides of the aisle. There's plenty of room, to, uh, plenty of blame to, uh, to go around. Today I received a, before I get to that, the decisions that will have to be made to balance our budget are no different with or without the balanced budget amendment. They're hard. They're difficult. And, uh, and I've got $15 trillion worth of evidence that we're not, doing those tough, we're not making those tough decisions without the balanced budget amendment. Technically, we could get it done, but we're not getting it done. And we are at absolutely no path to get that done. I received today a, sir, a, a petition from Jim Keffer, state representative from Texas, signed by 969 other good Texans urging me to support this balanced budget amendment. Mr. Speaker, I would encourage all of my colleagues to think about the future of this country. How much better off uh, will this country be with the balanced budget amendment? This is the only thing that we are contemplating doing over the next 15 years that has a remote chance of fundamentally changing for the better the future that my seven grandchildren face. It is a bleak future they face today. We can fundamentally change that future for the spending, the spending efforts of this country with a balanced budget amendment that will force us to do the things that everybody else does. I urge all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to pass this, uh, support this balanced budget amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, it's now my privilege to yield to uh, Jesse Jackson, Jr., a distinguished member from Chicago, Illinois, as much time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong opposition to H.J. Res. 2, the balanced budget amendment. We do need to responsibly reduce our budget deficits and debt, but the best way to do that is by investing, building, and growing our economy, or through balanced economic growth, not a balanced budget amendment. What is the most important question to be raised with respect to the BBA? We have serious gaps in our society that need to be narrowed. Economic gaps between the rich and the poor, ask the 99 percent. Social gaps between racial minorities and the majority population. Gender gaps, women earn 76, 76 cents to the dollar of what men earn. Generational gaps, will Social Security be there for the next generation? Infrastructure gaps, upgrades to roads, bridges, ports, levees, water and sewer systems, high-speed rail, airports, and more in order to remain competitive in the world marketplace. So the most important question, Mr. Chairman, is this. How does the BBA narrow these economic, social, gender, generational, and infrastructure gaps? It won't. It simply exacerbates them. The BBA will permanently establish the United States as a separate and unequal society. The BBA will balance the federal budget on the backs of the poor, the working class, and the middle class. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and the Citizens for Tax Justice say that the BBA would damage our economy by making recessions deeper and more frequent, heighten the risk of default and jeopardize the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, lead to reductions in needed investments in the future, favor wealthy Americans over middle and low-income Americans by making it far more difficult to raise revenues and easier to cut programs, and it would weaken the principle of majority rule. Before we affirm, before this Congress affirms a balanced budget amendment, we need to consider our future, not just the future of America's debt, but America's future. Do we want a future that is bright with promise, a future with innovation, a future with the best schools, the brightest students, and the strongest and healthiest workers? Do we want to continue to lead in the world? My answer is yes. Mr. Speaker, I respectfully urge my colleagues to vote no on this irresponsible and short-sighted amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Speaker, I yield myself 30 seconds to answer the question, what did the 99 percent want? Well, CNN asked them in July. The answer was 74 percent favored a balanced budget amendment. 74% of men, 75% of women, 76% of white voters, 72% of non-white voters, 72% of 18 to 34-year-olds, 74% of 35 to 49-year-olds, 75% of 50 to 64-year-olds, 79% of 65 and older voters want a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. At this time, it is my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Culberson, a member of the Appropriations Committee. Recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I first of all want to thank the Congressman from Virginia. Uh, Bob Goodlatte has been a relentless and tireless advocate for balancing the budget of the United States of America with a constitutional amendment. And we are here tonight debating it because of his perseverance. I want to thank Speaker Boehner. I want to thank the people of America for electing a constitutional majority to the House. Elections make a huge difference. And we must pass this amendment to the Constitution tonight. The Senate must take a vote on it, and the people of America should hold every member of Congress accountable for their vote, because this is a defining vote on a defining evening for the United States Congress. How much more prosperous would America be today if the Senate had passed this amendment 16 years ago? How much stronger would America be today? The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said, has been pointed out earlier, that America's greatest strategic threat is our national debt. What better evidence of that is there that the people of Europe tonight are facing panic selling of European Union debt. Greece, Italy, Portugal are all on the brink. We cannot let America continue down this path. We have an obligation to our children and grandchildren to ensure that the nation's books are balanced just as every American must do, just as 49 out of 50 states must do, just as every business in America must do. This is just fundamental common sense. No amount of confusion or distraction on the part of the opponents can divert the country's attention from the simple 
common sense fact that an amendment to the Constitution requiring a balanced budget requires America to live within its means, to spend no more in, uh, that is brought in by revenue. My hero Thomas Jefferson said, and his words ring so true today in light of the problems we face, that to preserve our independence as Americans, we must not let our rulers load us down with perpetual debt. We must make our choice, America, between economy and liberty and profusion and servitude. I want to thank Congressman Goodlatte for his leadership and perseverance on this vitally important issue. And I'm looking forward to the day in 15 to 16 years from today when this amendment passes the Congress, when it passes the states overwhelmingly, so that my daughter and her children will inherit America that's more prosperous and more secure because of Bob Goodlatte and John Boehner's leadership in bringing this to the floor tonight so that we will, as a nation, continue to live within our means. The gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman Mr. from Speaker, uh, Michigan is recognized. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. He is chairman of the Counterterrorism and Intelligence Subcommittee of the Homeland Security Committee. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for yielding. One trillion one dollar bills. We're talking about trying to make sense of a trillion dollars. If they were stacked on top of each other, they would reach nearly 68,000 miles into the sky, about a third of the way from the Earth to the moon. As of yesterday, our national debt was 15 times that $1 trillion. Fifteen years ago, the balanced budget amendment passed the House with bipartisan support, only to lose by one vote in the Senate. Since that time, our nation's debt has grown $9.2 trillion more. Every day, families make tough decisions in order to live within their means. But when it comes to our country's bank account, both parties in Washington simply don't practice these responsible habits. It is wrong for us to accumulate this mounting debt that we know we're never going to repay. Instead, we expect our children and our grandchildren to do so. It's our obligation to pass on the blessings of liberty not a crushing debt to our posterity. A certain way to ensure that is that Congress and the President will not allow the U.S. to be driven further into debt, and that is to pass an amendment to the Constitution forcing our government to balance the budget each year. Promising to make cuts in federal spending is one thing, but an amendment to the Constitution demanding it is quite another. A balanced budget would legally force Congress to spend only what it takes, and it protects taxpayers and small businesses from the threat of higher taxes to cover Washington's spending habits. This will be for a better future for our children and our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I reserve. I continue to reserve. The gentleman from Michigan continues to reserve. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. He is a member of the Homeland Security Committee. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, sir. Every month, millions of American families make tough financial decisions about how they'll pay their bills, balance their budget, and make ends meet. They make tough choices and do without things they want so they can have the things that they need. The American people have to make these tough choices, and we, as their elected leaders, need to do the same thing. America cannot continue to spend more than we take in. A balanced budget amendment to the Constitution will ensure our grandchildren do not have to deal with the reckless mistakes Congress has already made by overspending and excessive borrowing. Our vote on this amendment will show hardworking American taxpayers who have a hard time balancing their own budgets which members of Congress get it and who are doing their jobs that they are elected to do. The current national debt is over $15 trillion, and that's way too much. 
Passing a balanced budget is the best way to ensure that we don't spend money we don't have on programs we don't need. The American people want a government that is responsible and accountable. A balanced budget, like almost every state has, like almost every family lives with, is a key to this responsibility and accountability. It makes our co economy stronger and healthier and preserves this great nation for generations to come. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. M Mr. Speaker, how much time remains on each side, please? The gentleman from Michigan has 86 and a quarter minutes remaining. The gentleman from Virginia has 91 minutes remaining. I continue to reserve. Mr. Gentleman Speaker. reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, at this time it is my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr. Goodlatte for introducing the bill, and I thank Mr. Goodlatte for the time. You know, um, I'm part of the Blue Dog Coalition, a group of conservative Democrats, and for 16 years the Blue Dogs have been advocating a balanced budget amendment. It really shouldn't be about Democrats and Republicans. You know, since I've been in Congress, I've been here when Democrats have controlled Congress and Republicans have controlled Congress. I've been here when Democrats have controlled the White House and Republicans have controlled the White House, and neither party has the best track record on the deficit issue. And that's why I think the balanced budget amendment makes sense, because I think we need a structural, a structural requirement that brings everyone to the table and says, this is what you've got to do, Democrats or Republicans. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. This should be an issue about setting a path forward that creates stability and sends the right message to the American people and to the rest of the world that we know how to live within our means. Now, um, I have to say that I wish we had more support on my side of the aisle than we do. Because I don't, as I said, I don't think it's a Democratic or Republican issue. I think it's an issue that we all ought to be looking at. Balancing the books, balancing your budget. Families do it every day. States do it. At least 49 states have a requirement for a balanced budget. I think that this country needs that too. And I urge all my colleagues to support this amendment and put us on a path to fiscal responsibility. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, I, I yield myself a, a one additional minute to uh, ask the speaker who just finished uh, if I could gain his attention for a moment. Uh, uh, and I thank the gentleman for coming back into the well. Uh, does the gentleman agree with me in uh, examining this bill that this bill risked default by the United States by requiring a supermajority to raise the debt limit, which is not the case now. You know, so and I, I yield to, the, to I my friend. I think it's the same threshold that requires us to make a decision to deficit spend. It's the same supermajority for that as well. So I think that what we do is we're putting a requirement in where if you want to default or if you want to, uh, want to raise the debt limit or if you want to deficit spend, it requires a supermajority. But if you want to pass a budget that is within balance, it doesn't require a supermajority. It requires a simple majority, and that's the way the bill is structured. Did the gentleman uh, say yes or no to my question? I said no. Uh, the, the, a supermajority is not required to As raise said, the debt limit under uh, this bill? I, I yield myself an additional minute, the recognized. and I yield to my friend. As I said, let's not do apples and oranges here. Let's do apples and apples. If this Congress wants to act in a way to pass a balanced budget, it doesn't require supermajority. If this Congress wants to make a decision to deficit spend, it can do that with a supermajority, and that's the same requirement as if it wants to raise the debt limit. By the way, if a simple majority balances the budget, there is no need to raise the debt limit. There's no need to raise the debt limit if we have a balanced budget, and that would be a simple majority to pass a balanced budget each year. Uh, I, I want to thank my, my colleague for answering the question. And I'd like now to turn to the gentleman uh, who represents the majority, uh, a distinguished member of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Goodlatte, and ask him if he happens to be aware of whether uh, 
I, I yield myself two additional minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Uh, and ask him if he is aware of the fact that H.J. Res 2 would require a supermajority to raise the debt limit. And I'm pleased to yield to the gentleman. Well, as the gentleman from Utah just correctly noted, it requires the same supermajority of 60 percent to not balance the budget or to raise the debt limit. Quite frankly, if you have a constitutional amendment in place that requires a balanced budget, you're going to generate surpluses most years, and therefore raising the debt limit will occur less and less frequently. But those two requirements are in place in order to have an enforcement mechanism so that Congresses of the future will not do what Congresses of the past have been doing. Did the gentleman a answer me with a yes? I'm sorry, would the gentleman repeat that? Well, did, did the gentleman understand the question? Yeah, I, I understand it and answered it. Well, was the answer yes or no to my question? The answer is yes, it requires a supermajority to raise the debt limit and a supermajority to not balance the budget, which would be uh, an unusual thing in the future because in the last 50 years it's only been balanced six times. Well, then let me ask my colleague this question. Does it presently require a supermajority to raise the debt limit? No, there is no such requirement Thank today. You. It, it isn't. And there would be in this bill, would it not? Absolutely. And the gentleman supports a supermajority to raise the debt limit? Very much so. I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman from Illinois. Is, is the gentleman aware that under such a scenario, a budget crisis in which a default becomes more threat is more likely because the limits placed on the fluidity of the debt ceiling I the yield myself becomes more for likely additional to occur? three minutes. The gentleman's recognized for three and minutes. And continue to yield to I, the I gentleman I thank the gentleman, Illinois. and my question is of the chairman as well. Under such a scenario where three-fifths votes of House would be permitted to raise the debt limit, a budget crisis in which a default becomes a more threat is obviously more likely. And because of the limits placed on the fluidity of the debt ceiling, that default becomes more likely to occur. Is it the gentleman's opinion that a small minority within the Congress uh, could indeed hold the entire nation hostage to I, such a vote? I don't agree with that at all. In fact, in the greatest uh, debt limit uh, crisis you might ever say we've had, which was just this summer, uh, close to, if not in excess of, 60 percent of the members of the House voted to raise the debt limit. So I don't believe that uh, future Congresses would be any more irresponsible. I think future Congresses are likely to be more responsible than prior Congresses because we have not balanced the budget for but six times in the last in 50 the years, we have a $15 trillion dollar debt, and that $15 trillion dollar debt is most Mr. likely May I reclaim to the cause time, Mr. Chairman. that uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, in the event that Congress fails uh, to, to act, obviously under this amendment, the courts would be empowered to provide remedial orders for when Congress failed to provide a balanced budget. The decisions would then force uh, the, the courts to be political in nature. Is it the gentleman's opinion that Judi the, judicial, the, judicial branch, the judicial branch and that members of the court are in a better position to make judgments about congressional budgets and about the nation's budgets than members of Congress? It's my opinion that the members of the United States Congress will uphold the oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and that that scenario will be very unlikely to occur and so when it does, judges will as they historically have on matters involving the internal business of the so Congress Mr. Chairman, exercise Mr. judicial restraint. Res respectfully Mr. Chairman, the courts could then mandate a government shutdown once revenue has been expended. Unlike the CRs that Congress passes, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to yield. Just two comments. Uh, first of all, going back to what you were discussing a moment ago, the answer to your question is that under this amendment, 40% of, ha of either House could hold the entire country hostage against the other 60%. 60% 60 right. could want a balanced budget, and there may be a necessity for an increase in the debt ceiling, but 40% could say no. 40% could hold the country hostage as we saw that fi the country was held hostage last year. Next, with this, it would be much easier to hold the, 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 uh, the, the country hostage because a minority, not a small minority, but 40% could do it. Uh, secondly, if the gentleman's answer is correct, that the courts would exercise judicial restraint and not 
in, they're not make decisions on tax increases or revenue or, or spending cuts, yeah, then, gonna, the whole, then there's no point to this whole amendment because you're saying it's unenforceable. Either the amendment is enforced by action of the court or it's not enforced. With, with, with I, I yield myself uh, an additional three minutes, Mr. Uh, Speaker. I, Illinois. And I, I would yield time to the gentleman I, I, from I think, Illinois. I thank the gentleman, the distinguished ranking member, and I thank the chairman for his response, but I want to raise a question with the, uh, uh, Mr. Nadler, uh, distinguished constitutionalist. Um, the courts could mandate, therefore, if Congress failed to pass a balanced budget, it could mandate a government shutdown once revenue has been expended. Is that correct? Well, the, court, the, the, the amendment is silent. All it says is this will happen. Um, this must happen. When this must happen, in our system of government, if, if it doesn't, or if someone thinks it's not going to, they go to court and they ask for a court order to make sure it happens. The court either will, there are two possibilities, and only two. One, the court will say, here's how we'll make it order. We'll raise this tax, we'll lower that expenditure. Or the court will say, in which case you have unelected judges making those decisions, um, and this amendment gives them no guidance on how to make those decisions, or the court will say, as the gentleman from Virginia just suggested the court would do, the court will exercise judicial restraint and will say this is a political question, we decline to, order, to make any order, in which case this amendment is not worth the paper it's written on because it's not enforceable at all. Either it's enforceable by the court saying increase this tax, decrease that expenditure, or it's not enforceable and it's a total joke, one way or the other. I, I yield back the to time to the gentleman from, from Michigan. Uh, I, I'd like to, to uh, yield to the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Bobby Scott. Thank you, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I think one of the things we're forgetting is during that spectacle last August, the United States lost its AAA credit rating, and so that was a simple majority. I just think you cannot make a serious case that it is fiscally responsible to increase the likelihood that we would go through that spectacle again. The other is we talk about a simple majority for a balanced budget or a supermajority for an unbalanced budget. We forget that a serious deficit reduction is technically unbalanced and you need three-fifths to pass a deficit reduction plan. And if you have a question of, of, of three-fifths, to pass a serious deficit reduction or new tax cuts and new spending totally irresponsible. And if you're trying to get up, to, if, you, if we know we need three-fifths this year to pass a budget, either deficit reduction or irresponsible, as you get closer and closer, how are you going to get those extra votes? Now, the tradition has been you get those extra votes with a little pork here and a little pork there. And rather than buying enough pork to get to a simple majority, you're going to have to give away enough to get to a 60 percent. And so the question is whether the three-fifths vote will make it more likely that you're going to have a serious deficit reduction or a totally irresponsible budget. In my view, I think the experience is it's hard enough to get a simple majority to pass meaningful deficit reduction. You'll never get to three-fifths. So you get your new tax cuts, you get your new spending. I'm going to get another aircraft carrier out of it. I don't know what you want, but uh, we need to get to three-fifths. Uh, that's, um, uh, could, you get it by more spending and more tax cuts. Could I conclude on this side by asking my friend from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, if he shares the view offered by uh, Mr. Scott? I not share the view offered by my good friend and colleague from Virginia, Mr. Scott. The fact of the matter is the downgrade that uh, we received in the bond ratings is due to the fact that we have a 15 trillion dollar debt uh, and the Congress has not come agree to agreement on sufficient reductions in that debt uh, to satisfy the bond rating agencies and a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution is exactly what's needed to put that kind of pressure on the Congress to make real and meaningful reductions in our deficits. May, may, I, may I get some... Yes, could I get some time from the, the other side to continue this discussion? I have uh, a lot of members who are planning to come uh, tomorrow to uh, uh, debate this issue, and uh, I'm going to have to reserve our time for that purpose. Well, the time is allotted already for tomorrow. The time we use tonight it, it will not be put on tomorrow. We, we have we've divided the time up. So you have a few minutes left if, if you care to share it, sir. Yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman will state his inquiry. Can time unused tonight be carried over tomorrow? Time unused tonight can be used tomorrow. The gentleman from Michigan Reserves. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to yield two minutes to the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Byrd. The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one year ago, as House freshmen, we came out here, and we were elected to change how Washington works. When we arrived in Washington, there was one thing we agreed, and that was that our country was on an unsustainable path. As I'm here tonight listening to some of this debate, I'm stunned that the way you get 260 votes is by pork. This is what's wrong with Washington. This is why it has to change. We know the crisis we're in. We've heard the $15 trillion in debt that matches our whole country's economy. Fifteen years ago, had we passed a balanced budget amendment, America would be the financial powerhouse of the globe. We would not be comparing ourselves to Greece and comparing ourselves to Europe. I strongly believe that the one fundamental thing that we can do to change the way Washington does business is to have a balanced budget amendment. We wouldn't need this amendment if we actually balanced the budget. We are at a critical stage of our nation's history. And tomorrow, we have the opportunity to make the future look better by passing this balanced budget amendment. This is Congress's opportunity to get it right. We can pass the balanced budget amendment and we can change the course of our, our country's future. It's time. Now's the time for the balanced budget amendment. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, how much time is remaining? The gentleman from Michigan has 76 and a quarter minutes remaining. You say seven and seven, 76 and a quarter. Uh, well, I, I, will, I will yield the balance of the time to myself for tonight. <laughs> gentleman reserves. Uh, a minute and a quarter. Oh, all right. I, I will yield a minute and a quarter, the time remaining uh, to, allotted to us for tonight. The gentleman yields a minute and a quarter to himself. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that uh, the uh, instructive discussion uh, that we've had here tonight uh, illustrates a irreconcilable problem. Uh, with the requirement that a supermajority is necessary under H.J. Res 2 to raise the debt limit. Uh, it's, it's, it's frequently difficult enough to raise the debt limit with a simple majority. Uh, and, and I'm sure that everyone in this chamber will r realize that by raising the requirement uh, by a considerable figure is going to make it nearly impossible to raise the debt limit. Now we've just gone through a summer of uh, problems with getting to raise the debt limit by a simple majority and now tonight we are told that we are going to make this a constitutional proposition in which we make it even more difficult. Could I, could I yield uh, uh, the last time to Mr. Goodlatte to, uh, for, for this explanation, sir, just for the record? Uh, could, could you explain to me how raising the debt limit to a supermajority is going to facilitate uh, a, a more uh, Progressive and operative expired. Congress. 
Well, the, the goal is to balance the budget and to pay down this enormous national debt of $15 trillion. The gentleman's time has expired. Does the gentleman from Michigan seek to yield himself additional time, or is the gentleman from, from Michigan Reserve? We have no more time. Mr. Speaker, how much gentleman time from is remaining recognized. on this side of the aisle? You can use your own time, of course. The gentleman from Virginia has 88 and a half minutes remaining. I'll, I'll yield myself 30 seconds just to say to the gentleman that the only time you're going to need to raise the debt limit is an occasion where you've already voted by a supermajority to not balance the budget. And therefore, under those circumstances, it seems entirely reasonable to me that you'd also have a supermajority to raise the debt limit. And that, I think, uh, is the key to w that provision. It's a discipline in this bill. Would the distinguished chairman yield to one question? Would the distinguished chairman just yield, yield to, to one? The gentleman. I thank the chairman. And I know the time is, expires quickly. Mr. Chairman, what is it that qualifies a federal judge to make a decision about the federal budget process? The gentleman's time's expired. I, I will yield myself an additional 30 seconds to respond to the gentleman. I, thank the gentleman. I, I will just say to the gentleman that uh, the uh, the doctrines that the court has imposed upon internal operations of the Congress have historically called for judicial restraint. So it will be very rare, in my opinion, that you will find courts involved in this process. And uh, I, I believe that uh, there is very good material which uh, we have uh, put into the record in the Judiciary Committee that would reflect upon just that process. The gentleman this, is something that the Congress, this is something that the Congress <coughs> has gentleman's to resolve expired. for itself, the, and that's why we need it in the Constitution, the because himself. the Congress does not resolve it now. I reserve gentleman's the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Pursuant to Section 2 of House Resolution 466, further consideration of this motion is postponed. The House lays before the Chair a message to the Congress of the United States, consistent with Section 7422C2 of Title 10, United States Code. I am informing you of my decision to extend the period of production of the Naval Petroleum Reserves for a period of three years from April 5, 2012, the expiration date of the currently authorized period of production. Attached is a copy of the report investigating continued production of the reserves consistent with Section 7422C2B of Title 10. In light of the findings contained in the report, I certify that continued production from the Naval Petroleum Reserves is in the national interest. Signed, Barack Obama, the White House. Referred to the Committee on Armed Service and ordered printed. The, house, or the chair lays before the House the following personal requests. Leaves of absence requested for Mrs. Napolitano of California for today and for the balance of the week and Mr. Bishop of Georgia for today. Without objection, the requests are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, is recognized for 60 minutes as, a de as designee of the Minority Leader. I uh, thank the Speaker for his courtesies. And uh, this opportunity allows the members of the Progressive Caucus to continue this discussion 
uh, and as well to continue to educate the American public. It is uh, worth noting <coughs> uh, that part of the discussion uh, that occurred on the floor of the House is that we have come to this point, uh, if I might say, through a peculiar process. Some might call it hostage taking, but certainly it is a process that has skewed, uh, if you will, the regular order of this Congress. Uh, this little book, uh, The Constitution of the United States, that can fit into a document of this size, even though it is found in law books and many major large size books found in the Library of Congress, hopefully convinces the American people of the wisdom of the Founding Fathers. It is noteworthy that they did not include a balanced budget amendment in the first group of amendments called the Bill of Rights. And even as they proceeded, they took uh, the challenge of speaking to any number of issues. Uh, the freeing of the slaves in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, giving the right to vote finally in the 15th Amendment, suggesting that there should be no obstacles to voting. They went on to the 24th Amendment, to indicate there should be no poll tax, the 19th Amendment giving the right of women to vote, but never did they feel the necessity to talk about a balanced budget amendment. And the reason I believe that they cast their lot on the responsible thinking of members of Congress is because that is what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to be responsible members of the United States Congress with no intervening body no layered approach, no handcuffing of our deliberation, and that's what a balanced budget amendment is all about. You've just listened to a portion of our debate, and we will go on uh, into tomorrow. Mind you, taking up five hours of time that could be dedicated to coming together around job creation. The underlying premises of this bill, Mr. Speaker, is that two-thirds of this body, two-thirds of the other body, and three-quarters of the state must consent to a balanced budget amendment. Thank goodness that our founding fathers made amending the Constitution so difficult. And that is because they wanted us to be thoughtful. So when we think of the amendments that are in this book, this little book that starts off with We the People, a part of the Declaration of Independence, and then uh, the beginning parts of the Constitution says that we have come together to form a more perfect union. They've made it that challenging so that we could be thoughtful uh, in our moving amendments. Maybe for those of us who are in certain types of church families, whether it be Baptist or the underlying overriding general Protestant structure, we know that there are pastors, ministers, reverends, there are board of trustees or uh, a board or there may be a deacon board. Uh, there's some sort of policy board and then there is a congregation. And the reason why I mention the faith community because we can get very sensitive about how our places of worship are run, how the business part of it is run. And you'd wonder how many congregations would welcome the overlay of some outside entity, albeit formed by members, that was over the pastor, that was over the board of trustees, that was over the congregation. That's what we have done and forced ourselves to do by the intervening super committee that was put together by the concept of the needing to raise the debt ceiling and then adding into it another hot pepper pot and that is, of course, having to be forced to pass a balanced budget amendment. I want to refer my colleagues again to a headline in a local paper indicating Sheila Jackson Lee can't slow down the Republican balanced budget amendment freight train. It's not necessarily because it was my name, but that's just what we have experienced, the freight train. I have no doubt... Um, 
that there will be a strong vote tomorrow. Uh, I am hoping that the debate will generate enough thought that would cause many of my colleagues to reflect on whether or not we could, in the regular order, uh, do some of the suggestions that have been made, uh, taxation of investment transactions, where many who are uh, well vested and who have experienced the bounty of this land would be willing to contribute and to understand how we should move forward. The expiration of the Bush tax cuts, another revenue uh, generator that would, I believe, increase uh, the opportunities for reducing the debt. Uh, getting rid of the mighty, uh, if you will, bungled uh, opportunity to help seniors becoming a gigantic handout and budgetary uh, fiasco, Medicare Part D, ask every senior uh, when you visit them at their senior centers, uh, are they begging for the closing of the donut hole, but more importantly, are they trying to get relief from Medicare Part D? Give them relief, close the donut hole, and you will find a huge amount of money going into the Treasury. Going back to the Affordable Care Act and implementing the public option and allowing the United States to negotiate on the cost of medication, prescription drugs under Medicare, and just watch the debt go down, down, down. And so I want to recite, as I did on the floor of the House, the words of Chairman Ben Bernanke, uh, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, who indicated to the Committee on Financial Services, we really don't want to just cut, 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 Chairman said. You need to be a little bit cautious about sharp cuts in the very near term because of the potential impact on the recovery. That doesn't at all preclude, in fact, I believe it's entirely consistent with a longer term program that will bring our budget into a sustainable position. Nowhere did he say, well, why don't you just do a balanced budget amendment with no thinking and not being able to deal with emergencies uh, beyond another vote by the Congress, sometimes the majority, sometimes even longer. Mr. Speaker, a balanced budget amendment was wrong when our founding fathers began to write the Constitution. Uh, it was wrong as the founding fathers wrote amendment after amendment. Uh, it was wrong to think about it in World War II to think about it in the 1929 financial collapse, to think about it in the conflicts of the 1950s, the Vietnam War, uh, wars thereafter, such as the Persian Gulf, uh, the Iraq War, uh, and of course the Afghan War, and uh, Kosovo, Bosnia, Albania, Libya, and places where we've been called to act on behalf of the American people in defending our honor and democracy and protecting the vulnerable around the world. It is wrong, wrong, wrong. What the American people who voted for members of the United States Congress are asking us to do is what the Progressive Caucus is doing. It is finding a way, first of all, to submit a reasoned budget that has seen a responsible approach to addressing the needs of revenue raising and belt tightening. What it is also asking is, as the Progressive Caucus is doing, drafting a major omnibus jobs bill that will incorporate a wide range of initiatives, many not costly initiatives, that will bring about jobs in America, not only for those languishing two and three years unemployed, but for our wonderful college graduates and others that are coming out of uh, the institutions of higher learning. But as Dr. Jeffrey Sachs has said, we have even more challenges, because although we all point to college graduates and going to institutions of higher learning, Maybe I should wake up America and let you know that uh, we have some of the lower numbers of college graduation numbers probably in the history of America. White males at 34 percent, African Americans somewhere under 20, and Hispanics under 11 or 11 percent. So the balanced budget amendment is not going to invest in the human resources of America. It's not going to answer the question uh, in our competitive reach as we compete around the world. It's not going to respond. Uh, to the numbers of PhDs that India is now producing, probably in years to come, more so than 
people in the United States or the number of masters and PhDs in China. Our reach and competition is way beyond our borders. But everyone knows that America's markability is our genius on invention and manufacturing, our genius as it relates to prescription drugs, our genius in medical science and medicine, our genius in Silicon Valley and the little Silicon Valleys that are springing up around America, our genius, for example, in the MD Anderson Medical Center located in Houston, Texas, the fourth largest city in the nation, magnificent research occurring in that institution, seeking a viable 21st century, 22nd century cure for this devastating disease, but also branching out for creative thinking in the next generation of research. That is the genius of America. We are not broke, and we're certainly not broke in our genius. Let us be reminded as we debate the balanced budget amendment that our corporations are flush with cash, our banks are flush with cash, uh, and countries around the world are eager to have us hold their money in the framework of loans that are being made to us. But if they wish to loan to anyone, they are eager to loan to the United States. Why? Because they believe their cash is safe. So it is important that we are thoughtful uh, in the idea of a balanced budget amendment and why now. Why are we doing a balanced budget amendment in the course of the need to do, as Dr. Sachs has said, long-term systematic changes in how we do business in the United States of America? So just take a fact sheet on the question of the balanced budget amendment. It came about because we went to the brink of raising the debt ceiling, something that had been done many times since President Eisenhower, going forward to presidents thereafter, many times under uh, Bush I, the uh, 41st president of the United States, many times under the 42nd president of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton, many times under the 43rd president of the United States, and lo and behold, an African-American president ascends to the presidency voted on by the American people, and the debt ceiling becomes a crisis in making. And frankly, the pundits, economists around the world indicated it was not the question of raising the debt ceiling. It was a debacle shown around the world that the members of Congress were not allowed to get their business in order. They were not allowed uh, to debate this in a reasoned manner. They were strung and strangled uh, by voices uh, that are driven by outside party politics. In this instance, the Tea Party uh, and those who adhere to pledges governed by Mr. Norquist. And so it is important that a constitutional debate be separated from uh, the entrenched political views uh, that would disallow a thoughtful discussion. We could have raised the debt ceiling with a thoughtful dis discussion, but it came with not strings, but laden, heavy steel bricks uh, tied to our arms and body as we walked slowly and dragged down. So we have a super committee. With great respect to those working, I have the greatest of respect for our colleagues and wish them well. Uh, we have the requirement of a balanced budget amendment, a constitutional discussion dragged down by the requirement that you're not going to get the debt ceiling raised. You're not going to be able to pay the bills uh, for our seniors and our soldiers on the battlefield if you didn't hang with all of this weight uh, to carry forth an instruction that really is not done thoughtfully. So here's what we get with the balanced budget amendment. We risk default by the United States by requiring a supermajority to raise the debt limit. It, adro it destroys 15 million jobs and doubles unemployment to 18%. If enacted in FY 2012, nonpartisan economists with macroeconomic advisors LLC estimate that enactment of a balanced budget amendment would eliminate 15 million jobs, double the unemployment rate to 18%, 
and cause the economy to shrink by 17%. Remember what I said, dragged down by steel anvils tied to our legs and arms, our ankles, around our neck. This is what we will be doing tomorrow. This is what the vote will entail tomorrow. Harm seniors by cutting Medicare and Social Security and veterans by reducing their benefits, even though Social Security is solvent until 2035, requiring a thoughtful decision of how we go forward, and even though there are ways uh, to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse from Medicare without cutting providers, we want to go with a balanced budget amendment which could result in Medicare being cut about $750 billion, Social Security $1.2 trillion, and Veterans Benefits $85 million through 2021. How many of us joined our neighbors in celebrating veterans on last Friday? I did. I joined Wallop Preparatory School, and we went to the Veterans Hospital and shook the hands of bedridden veterans and promised them by giving them cards of cheer uh, that we would not in any way cut their benefits. Would, would the gentleman